On the agenda tonight, we're going back to 1967. We're going to be taking a look at the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, and they're going to be performing Drifting Blues. <laughs> Hello, Phil here from Wings of Pegasus and welcome to another analysis video. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. So let's get Paul and the guys up on screen and see how they get on. I'm just going to jump in here as we build up to the harp solo that's about to come in from Paul. As always, the link to this video is going to be in the description below so you guys can check it out without me interrupting it there. So what we've got here, classic blues here at the Monterey Pop Festival, by the way, where Janis Joplin, who's also on the channel here somewhere, was performing and that was the performance that I looked at in that other video. But here with Paul, the whole setup we've got, that vocal that he lays down, we'll also see in a second the way that he can lay it down in a solo section as well. But he just leans into his chest voice. He's got so much range in there as well. It might fly under the radar right at the end of the performance. When we're talking about range, he just flips up in his head voice to a G5 and an F5, which is way up there. I mean, that is above the male tenor high C, which is a C5. We've got the C5, the C sharp 5, the D5, the D sharp 5, the E5, the F5, the F sharp 5, and the G5. So we're talking about some serious height in terms of pitch that we're getting to here. He is in and around A sharp, which is gonna be the key for this performance as well. And we will get the guitar out at the end of this video just to go through some of the playing going on here from Elvin Bishop, by the way, on guitar again. He's got another video here on the channel somewhere, so you can check out Elvin independently if you want to. But we will have a little go through keys on the guitar and a basic lead shape to get you guys going. And for reference, we've got way more than an octave going on here because the way that Paul sings in the verse, we're down pretty much at a B flat three, and then that ascends to a B flat four, and as you can tell, then going higher into the fives, obviously B flat four goes into B four, and then you go into C five at that point. So when those fifth octave notes start to take off, we've gone well beyond that B flat three of an octave, but I don't want to get bogged down with all of the notes too much. He has that body to his tone throughout his range, 
And also when he's leaning into that chest voice, adding that rasp to it as well, totally under control. He's got the little runs that he ends lines with. Sometimes he'll throw in a bit of vibrato, sometimes he'll just tail off a line. So he's got everything that you want in a blues singer. And he's also got that expression in his voice as well. But what we're gonna do is jump back into the performance straight into this harp solo, harmonica, by the way, listen out for his control and how he gets this solo instrument to talk. And it sounds like a voice. We will go into the way that he achieves that afterwards, but something that I mentioned in, I think yesterday's video when we were looking at Peter Green about expression, getting the instrument to talk and sound like a voice, I said about how it doesn't matter what instrument it is, it's all down to the player's ability, their technical ability to put that instrument into such a place where it sounds like a voice and it communicates. And that's exactly what we get with Paul here, but let's jump back into the video and appreciate it. And there we have it. I just wanted to wait for the wow at the end there. So much expression in that solo section and so much control. You could see by the way that Paul is expressing himself through his harp, having that control, facially he's saying exactly what he wants to through the instrument. He's not just trying to hit particular notes and working on his technique and concentrating on just getting the harmonica in the right place, he's saying something through the instrument. And that is what it's all about. Obviously, you've got to work your way up to getting to the level of technical ability to then express yourself through the instrument. But when you get somebody at this level, it's a voice that you hear. And the way that he manipulates the sound by using his left hand, 
to sometimes fan the harmonica. And this is something that you'll hear the difference in the sound waves coming out of the harmonica, but it also has this wah-wah sound to it. It is so well controlled, the expression that's in there using that left hand in order just to shape the sound. Just to give you guys an example of how that is done, I know that a lot of people will refer to the wah-wah pedal on the guitar, but that doesn't necessarily give you an understanding of what's happening. The best way to demonstrate it is by making a wah-wah sound with your mouth, and you'll realize that the noise, or at least the sound that's coming out of your mouth, is turning from going through a closed space to an open space. So it means that that wah opening means that if you apply that to the harmonica, blow into it and open your hand up, you're doing the same thing. You're making more space from a closed space. And that's how that wah-wah is achieved so well here by Paul. Absolutely nailed on that technique to the point where it sounds like a voice and it sounds like a cry. This performance from the band as a whole is so well put together as well because we have so many different elements popping in and out. We've got a horn section in there. We've got Elvin on lead guitar. We've got bass. We've got a little bit of keys coming in as well. So we have so many instruments in the mix, but the most important thing is leaving those spaces. And that is something that Elvin does really well. He just throws in an occasional lead line here or there. He doesn't go off on one playing lead guitar. It's very much making sure that the solo is the focus from Paul and not the rest of the band. So when Paul gets into that, I think Unfortunately, the volume does drop on the video, so I'm gonna try and edit that and change it. Obviously, when talking about Paul playing the harmonica, it's not something that you can play and sing at the same time, but he falls into that category of an artist who had a fantastic voice, fantastic range, and control as well, but mastered an instrument. So it means that he could hold your attention for a whole solo section on that instrument. And that is such a rare thing, especially nowadays, to find mainstream artists who are great singers, great performers, and are at the top level technically at an instrument in order for them to go into a solo and get something else in the mix, get another voice taking center stage, because that is what's happening. We've got the voice that Paul lays down vocally, but then you've got his harmonica's voice as well. Something I wanna show you guys quickly on the guitar, this song being a great example of classic blues progression and a great tool to use in order to get your lead playing a little bit further on, even if you're just starting out. It's great just to put on a blues progression and play along to it. In this case, we are in a sharp or B flat. And this is just a seventh chord that I'm playing here, sixth fret of your guitar in the bar chord position. So you'll also see Elvin playing a sixth chord in there as well, which will be the D sharp or the E flat sixth and that'll also shift up a tone because we are playing through that classic blues progression. And by the way, that's just an F sixth chord if you want that one. So getting into this A sharp or B flat position, a lot of people might struggle with playing in between the keys that they've learned. For example, they might be able to solo in D or an A or an E, but then when you say A sharp or B flat, they start to get a little bit confused as to where they actually go to play. I wanna show you a couple of things, just if you're starting out playing lead guitar, how to play in every single key instantly without having to learn lots of theory and scales, just starting at the bottom of the guitar if you play your open string, that's an E. That is what the note is called. And in the alphabet of music, it only goes up to G. So it goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and it keeps on going forever and ever and ever. So it means that once you get to E, which is where we're starting, the next E is where the two dots are. So all of these frets are giving you every note that there is, including the sharps and the flats, until you start again at these two dots here. And that's what these signify, it's called an octave. So it means that if you go all the way up your E string, 
you've played all the notes that there are. So it means that if you can play a single shape starting on your low E string, you'll be able to play through all of the keys. And that's exactly what we're gonna do here. So we're gonna bust out pentatonic shape one again. So it means that getting your first finger, I'm gonna place it on the first fret of my low E string. And this is an F because E's here, the F is the next fret. It's gonna be the first fret is your F. And then you just wanna follow the rule of having one finger per fret. So it means that when I put down my second finger, it's the next fret up from my first finger, the third finger is the next fret up, and the little finger is the next fret up from that. So it means that now all you have to remember with this shape is which finger to put down. So this shape goes, I'm gonna call the fingers one, two, three, and four. So we go one, four, one, three, one, three, one, three, one, four, one, four. So this is the minor pentatonic shape one in F. Now, if you look on your fretboard, you've got dots on there as well. And these help you out with navigation. So once you're on your F here, if you jump to the first dot, you get G. It's just like the alphabet. And we know that the music alphabet stops at G and it goes to A again. So the next dot is A. And then the next dot is B. So you've got G, A, B. Really easy access to G, A, B, because you've got dots there. The next note is gonna be a C, which is just one fret up. So you have to concentrate here. Don't keep on going up by two. You just wanna go up one so that your C here, when we go up, the D is here. So these are the two where we have a dot in between where your shape would be happening. And then we have to shift up two to get to the D. But in short, whatever your first finger is playing, that is going to be your key. So if we're in the key of A sharp, you go to A because you can remember G, A, B. It's pretty straightforward. Once you keep on reinforcing it in your brain that that's a G, that's an A, that's a B, then you'll be fine and you'll be able to remember these notes on this low E string with a bit of repetition. So once we know where A is, an A sharp is just one note higher. So you just move it one note higher. And now, we've got that pentatonic shape one in A sharp. And this is in the minor key. But the major key is gonna be exactly the same shape. You've just gotta move the shape to a different position. But we won't worry about that yet because when you're playing the blues, this is the shape that you wanna be able to play. So when we're going, all of those notes, as you can hear there, they all fitted. So it means that any line that you're playing, those are all just these notes, but it's just a case of experimenting in and around that shape and knowing that you're in A sharp. But it means that if we wanna play in G, remember where the G was. You can pick any notes that you want, just throw it anywhere B. And you can see that you just get instant access to all of your keys because by the time you get to here, we've come up to E again, E, E. So now, as long as you know the key of what you're playing along to, you'll be able to jump to wherever that note is, the key, for example, B, A, G. You'll be able to jump to there with your first finger and then apply this shape. Something I wanna show you really quickly, just a hack to know all the notes on your fretboard without having to sit down and study a page and try and remember them visually, which a lot of people get confused by. 
Just knowing your low E string notes and your A string notes will give you access to every single note on the fretboard, knowing what they are, because it's just the same notes repeated over and over again, because we only ever go up to G. So as an example, G here, hopefully you can remember this, because we went G, A, B, C, D, E, E down at the bottom, F, G, A, B. These are always gonna be here, they're never gonna move. It's always gonna be G, A, B in that section of the guitar. So, when we play the G, if you put down your third finger on the next string, but then put it on the next string down, so we've got a string in between our first finger and our third finger, we now get the octave of the note that we're playing with the first finger. So this is a G and a G but they're an octave apart. So you've got the G and go through the whole alphabet again, musically, until you get to G again. And this is what the next G sounds like. Now, replace your third finger with your first finger. So now, my first finger's playing this note, which we already know is a G. And now place on your little finger, not on the next string down, but again, skip over a string, and do it on the B string, which will be up there. So we've got this G, and I've skipped over the next string, placed down my little finger, and I get the next G, the next octave. So that is when we've gone through the alphabet again, and we get to G again. So it's that second octave. So all together we've got G, G, and then I replace my first finger with my first finger, and place in that little finger. And you want to make sure that when you're doing this cycle and going through it, you always want to skip over a string because there's too many notes for it to be on one string straight onto the next and get an octave. It's got to be a little bit of a distance away because there's lots of notes you have to cover to go through the whole alphabet to get to the next octave. So once you've got that, you've now got all of the Gs like that, and you haven't had to learn the fretboard. So this means that everywhere I go on this low E string, it doesn't matter what I do, there are all of my A sharps and B flats. A sharp and B flat. It's the same note, but depends how you're getting to it, whether you're going down or whether you're going up. But you can move that first finger anywhere. You can even do this as an experiment, not even knowing what the notes are on your low E string, but just going and just play the octaves because then when you do know where you started, the other notes are gonna be exactly the same notes. You just have to remember what they are and remember first finger, third finger, replace, and then little finger. And you'll be able to use this to identify any note on your fretboard. Remember, when you get to the two dots, the guitar repeats again. So everything that happened down here is now happening up here, and the octaves are gonna be all the same. You only have to learn it once on this first guitar. Let me just throw in there as well, on these strings, the A string, the D string, and the G string, when we go here, wherever you've got two frets of a gap, you'll find that you can put your middle finger down there. So within that shape, you can start to get something a little bit more interesting sounding when you are. And you don't even have to think about it, just put down your middle finger wherever there is a gap for your middle finger to go down. This is why keeping the fingering really strict is a great idea because it means that you can put down that middle finger whenever you want to when you have that gap. And you can start to get a lot more interesting sounding playing going on even though we're still just in that pentatonic shape one. I don't want this video to go on for too long, it probably already has due to getting sidetracked with the guitar, but I'll have to feature Paul again in the future to get into his career and history as well. Something that I did plan on doing in this video, but I won't have time to get through all of that. It will go on much too long. 
You might have noticed as well, by the way, Mike Bloomfield applauding the band at the end because he had just left the band at this point. And Elvin was with the band for quite a while on lead guitar. Like I said, I'll have to get into all of this later. But thank you guys so much for suggesting this video for me to take a look at and keep those suggestions coming in the comments below. Let me know what you guys think. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. And I'll see you guys at the next one. Rock.